This is a strange video for me to make. I considered not making it, but then I thought that actually there are people, too many people, that might need some advice at this terrible time we are living with so many deaths. I don't really expect someone who has to make a funeral speech to search online for help on preparing it. And rightly so. Preparing such a speech is extremely is an extremely personal responsibility, where you will search inside yourself, your heart and your memories for the feelings and then the words to describe them. The thought of looking online for advice might feel like you are cheapening or not paying respect to this most serious of tasks. This is something that the best man does for speeches at a wedding, not what one does for a funeral speech. When I prepared the speech for my father's funeral many years ago, I, I didn't read anything online about how to prepare it. So this advice that I want to give to you today is for the brothers and sisters, husbands and wives and best friends who might be asked by the speaker for their thoughts on the speech before it's delivered, for help. In my preparation for the speech I gave at my dad's funeral, I got great help from my brother Sean. My aim here is to give some simple and proven advice on how to structure the speech. Many times content, our ideas, struggles to find a structure that does it justice. Structure will help you clarify your thoughts and feelings and it will help the audience to understand and feel what you're trying to convey. In all speeches, the speaker should be addressing a need of the audience. In the case of a funeral, the audience needs someone to put words on the feelings of the occasion, to make sense of it. We all have feelings at such, on such occasions, and those feelings will vary in kind and in, and in intensity from one person to another. The problem is that we are not all very good at putting words to our feelings or to the feelings of the entire group. And that is why we look to the speaker at a funeral to articulate those feelings for us, and perhaps less obvious, to highlight the shared values of the community at this time. I'm going to use two speeches from the same funeral as examples to speak about some of the particular aspects of both structure and delivery that might be helpful to you to take into account as you prepare this difficult speech. The funeral is that of um, Senator John McCain from a few years ago, and the two funeral speeches I've chosen to use as examples are the two made by Barack Obama and George W. Bush. Let's begin with openings. When opening any ceremonial speech, the simplest and best way to open is with the traditional, today we are here to the goal here is to gather the audience under the same emotional umbrella. It is important to start with we, as with the speech your aim is to speak for everyone present. Your job here is to identify the emotional state of the audience and yourself and put words to it. Let's look at how Obama and Bush opened their speeches. We come to celebrate an extraordinary man. A warrior, a statesman, a patriot who embodied so much that is best in America. Uh, Cindy and the McCain family, I am honored to be with you to offer my sympathies and to celebrate a great life. Some lives are so vivid, it's difficult to imagine them ended. Some voices are so vibrant and distinctive, it's hard to think of them stilled. A man who seldom rested is laid to rest, and his absence is tangible, like the silence after a mighty roar. So as you, as you saw, Obama begins by we come to celebrate an extraordinary man, to celebration. Bush says we're here to offer sympathies and celebrate a great life. 
And Bush talks about the emotional state of the audience, which is, it's hard to believe that he's gone. Next, you need to talk about your own feelings, not just a collective feeling. The goal here is to connect with the audience by laying your heart bare, by speaking your true sentiments. Be honest and don't pretend to have feelings you don't have. Doing this will convey three important messages. I am feeling the same as what you're feeling. I'm not afraid of showing my inner self. And these emotions have a meaning. When examining your own feelings, you'll probably find that they're mixed. This is completely natural, even if they seem contradictory. As you will see now in the videos, both Bush and Obama speak about an array of mixed feelings about the death of John McCain. But the important thing is that they finish on the positive emotions. So you're about to see Obama saying how the emotions are honor, sadness, surprise, and, admir and admiration. And Bush speaking about frustration, rivalry, and friendship. Let's watch the video. So for someone like John to ask you while he's still alive, to stand and speak of him when he's gone is a precious and singular honor. Now, when John called me with that request earlier this year, I'll admit sadness and also a certain surprise. But for all our differences, for all the times we sparred, I never tried to hide, and I think John came to understand the long-standing admiration that I had for him. Back in the day, he could frustrate me. And I know he'd say the same thing about me. But he also made me better. In recent years, we sometimes talk of that intense period like football players remembering a big game. In the process, rivalry melted away. In the end, I got to enjoy one of life's great gifts, the friendship of John McCain, and I'll miss him. After speaking about your own personal feelings, now it's, now it's time to talk about the meaning of these feelings. By talking about, about why everyone is here, what we're all feeling, and then laying your own heart bare, you'll have connected with the audience. Now it's important you go the extra step and talk about what all this means. And the way to do this is to connect these feelings to shared values and principles of the community. Let's see how Obama and Bush do it. To consider what were we doing for our country? What might we risk everything for? Understand that some principles transcend politics. That some values transcend party. That part of what makes our country great is that our membership is based not on our bloodline, not on what we look like, what our last names are, it's not based on where our parents or grandparents came from or how recently they arrived, but on adherence to a common creed that all of us are created equal, endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. It's this combination of courage and decency that makes the American military something new in history an unrivaled power for good. It's this combination of courage and decency that set America on a journey into the world to liberate death camps, to stand guard against extremism, and to work for the true peace that comes only with freedom. The strength of a democracy is renewed by reaffirming the principles on which it was founded. And America somehow has always found leaders who were up to that task particularly at the time of greatest need. So as you see, Obama says that all of us are created equal with 
inalienable, inalienable rights. And Bush, the meaning that Bush gives to it is that it's the combination of courage and decency that was so important in McCain and in the society. So whenever we talk about meaning, it's best to use special rhetorical devices. It's not enough just to say the meaning is X. Instead, we need to breathe life into that meaning by using poems and quotes, metaphors and imagery, rhythms of speech, examples from history. In this video and in this excerpt from those speeches, you're going to see both Obama and Bush using some of these devices to speak about meaning. And it brings to mind something that Hemingway wrote in the book that Megan referred to, his favorite book. Today is only one day in all the days that will ever be. But what will happen in all the other days that ever come can depend on what you do today. And more than once during his career, John drew comparisons to Teddy Roosevelt. And I'm sure it's been noted that Roosevelt's man in the arena oration seems tailored to John. Most of you know it. Roosevelt speaks of those who strive, who dare to do great things, who sometimes win and sometimes come up short, but always relish a good fight a contrast to those cold, timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. When day after day, year after year, that youthful iron was tempered into steel. In captivity, John learned, in ways that few of us ever will, the meaning of those words. How each moment, each day, each choice is a test. It's this combination of courage and decency that makes the American military something new in history an unrivaled power for good. It's this combination of courage and decency that set America on a journey into the world to liberate death camps, to stand guard against extremism, and to work for the true peace that comes only with freedom. Finally, at the end of the funeral speech, it's good to talk about the future. It's the natural next step. You started talking about feelings, then you, then you spoke about the meaning of those feelings, then the shared values. So this brings us to talking about what this means for our future. You've probably been chosen to speak because of your position within this community, or your relationship to the person who has died, or because of your achievements. Therefore, you are in a privileged and hopefully, hopefully respected position to be able to talk about the future. Here you can see the excerpts from the speeches where they talk about the future. Isn't that the spirit we celebrate this week? That striving to be better, to do better, to be worthy of the great inheritance that our founders bestowed. If we're ever tempted to forget who we are, to grow weary of our cause, John's voice will always come as a whisper over our shoulder. We are better than this. America is better than this. John was a restless soul. He really didn't glory in success or wallow in failure because he was always on to the next thing. Friends said he can't stay in the same experience. One of his books ended with the words, and I moved on. John has moved on. He would probably not want us to dwell on it, but we are better for his presence among us. The world is smaller for his departure, 
and we will remember him as he was, unwavering, undimmed, unequal. As you saw, Obama talks about striving to be better, to do better and be worthy of our inheritance. And Bush talks about always remember that we are better than this, that America is better than this. Now let's talk about the length of the speech. The shorter, the better. Remember that this ceremony, it isn't about you. So make your speech short. While Obama is generally lauded as having been a much better speaker than Bush, I do prefer Bush's speech over Obama's at the funeral. Because one of the principal reasons is that Bush took just seven minutes to make his speech, while Obama took 20 minutes. Now let's talk about delivering the speech, the moment when you stand up to speak it at the funeral. It's important to know how to use meaningful pauses when delivering a funeral speech, as this occasion is laden with meaning, and you will want to give space for your carefully selected words to resonate with the audience. Give space in the form of silence during the speech for people to reflect on the emotion, connect with their own emotions, and think about the meaning of the occasion. In terms of body language, use more restrained movement and gestures when delivering a funeral speech, as your body language should reflect the depth and weight of the emotional content. Of course, there's no problem with being more animated at certain points in the speech, but the baseline should lean more towards restraint. Finally, if there are other speakers at the event, check with them about what they all plan to say. At my father's funeral, I planned to open my speech speaking about what my father had written to my mother in a birthday card just a few weeks before he died. The priest and our close family friend Dennis spoke just before me, and despite this, the, the seriousness of the occasion, I couldn't help but smile as I heard him open his speech talking about the very same birthday card, exactly what I had planned. In the end, it led to one of the more lighthearted moments of the funeral as when I got up to speak, I told everyone that Dennis had stolen the opening to my speech. I hope this advice helps you help someone prepare a speech for the funeral, for the funeral of a loved one. The most important thing is to speak from the heart with honesty and authenticity. My aim here is only to present you with a simple structure to allow those feelings to flow more freely and clearly.